News about the number of lives lost broke on April the 16th, 1912, one day after the disaster. Grieving relatives of the victims were desperate to know how the impossible could have happened. The Titanic was designed to be the most luxurious, but also the safest ship ever built. Even if she was rammed by another ship, she would stay afloat. Yet she took only two hours to sink after colliding with an iceberg. Two weeks later, a public inquiry was set up to find out if the disaster could have been avoided and if anyone was responsible for the loss of 1,523 lives. The chief counsel for the British government was the celebrated barrister, Sir Rupert Isaacs. The key witness was Bruce Ismay, the 50-year-old chairman of White Star, the owner of Titanic, and one of the few men who had survived the maiden voyage. Also called were wireless operator Harold Bride and second officer Charles Lightholler, the most senior officer to survive. As most of the crew had died in the disaster, these three men's testimony would be vital in deciding whether the ship's crew or the ship's owners had been negligent. Call Mr. Risley. I gather that you yourself gave the instructions for the building of the Titanic. Yes. And of course you considered the question of floatability of the ship in cases of accident or emergency. We did. Did you give any special consideration to the question of providing additional lifeboat accommodation? I think the position was taken that the ship was looked upon as being practically unsinkable she was looked upon as a lifeboat herself. Two years before the scheduled launch date, Ismay had met with his chief designer, Alexander Carlyle. It was a meeting that would start the chain of events that would lead to disaster. Their first decision would compromise the structural integrity of the ship. Okay. The staircase needs to be much grander. Well, the bulkhead will have to be lowered. Is there a problem? Isn't she safe? Of course. Excuse me. Each of the 16 compartments is watertight. In the event of a leak, each compartment can be sealed off by an electric power door operated from the bridge. Even if four compartments flood, she'll stay afloat. Good. Let's lower the bulkheads then. I want a great, sweeping, luxurious staircase. <clears throat> The height of the watertight compartments would be lowered to only 10 feet above the waterline. The boat deck should not be so cluttered. Cluttered? Yes, cluttered. People don't pay to look at lifeboats. Well, I thought 48 to be a reasonable amount, especially if the Board of Trade increased the requirements. Well, let's not second guess the British Board of Trade, shall we? Let's move on. To the Grand Salon. And this meeting with Mr. Ismay lasted four hours? Yes, we talked about the whole of the decorations of the ship. Never mind the decorations, we're talking about lifeboats. Well, the lifeboat part, I suppose, took about five or ten minutes. And how many lifeboats did you think there ought to be? I thought there ought to be three on each set of davits. And how many would that make altogether? Forty-eight boats. You thought there ought to be forty-eight? Yes. Whereas in point of fact, how many were there? Sixteen. Sixteen. While Carlyle was changing his designs for the Titanic, 2,000 miles away on the West Greenland coast, a glacier made of 10,000-year-old snow reached the ocean. A mass of ice then broke free from the glacier, giving birth to an iceberg. It was one of 40,000 icebergs born each year along the Greenland coast. One month later, the newly created iceberg had started a journey that could last over two years, 
and take it around Baffin Bay and onto Newfoundland. But the chances of surviving the treacherous seas were slim. Tens of thousands of icebergs break off of Greenland every year, come down the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland, and a very small percentage of those, maybe only one to four percent, will make their way to where they become a threat to shipping. Tracking the unusual path of these icebergs is a continual challenge for the Ice Patrol's oceanographer, Donald Murphy. People are often surprised to find out that when an iceberg comes off from the Greenland glacier, its first mo movement is not southward towards the shipping lanes, but in fact it starts moving northward along the coast of Greenland before its southward journey. In April 1910, the iceberg continued its journey up the West Greenland coast, carried along by the ocean's current. At the same time, work began on building the hull of the Titanic, the largest ship in the world. Shipbuilding was in transition. Machine was replacing man and steel was replacing iron. The builders of the Titanic wanted the hull to be made of steel plates held together with steel rivets. This was only possible using a large pneumatic riveting machine. But this equipment was too bulky to be used in the curved areas of the ship. So instead, men had to seal the plates manually using wrought iron rivets, which were easier to hammer into place. It was a widespread practice, and for nearly a century, nobody suspected it had anything to do with the sinking of the ship. But this all changed in 1996, after an expedition to the wreck of the Titanic when they discovered for the first time that iron rivets had been used to make part of the hull. Jennifer Hooper McCarty was part of a team at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore that began a forensic investigation of the rivets. The first step in the forensic investigation was to find out what those rivets were made of and how that material would act under different mechanical tests. To explore the effects of using wrought iron rather than steel, a section of the Titanic's hull was reproduced using steel plates held together by iron rivets. We compared a wrought iron rivet to a steel rivet and found that with just very little movement of the steel plate, five millimeters, you would reach a point in the wrought iron rivet when it would begin to fail. So here we have a ship that's unsinkable, that's state of the art for 1912, that's built with one and a half inch thick steel plates and wrought iron rivets. In 1910, even though they knew that steel was stronger than iron, the builders of the Titanic thought that the iron in the bow section would be strong enough, but it would prove to be a fatal flaw. From the very day that she was designed, she was almost doomed. So this is the, if you like, you could put it as bluntly as this is the, almost the Achilles heel of the Titanic. By May 1911, work on the hull was completed. After checking that every steel plate and every seam was watertight, it was launched into the wet dock. Nobody was aware of the weakness hidden away in the bow of the ship or the presence of an iceberg 2,000 miles away. By the summer of 1911, the iceberg was 18 months old and drifting around Baffin Bay, an area where most icebergs come to the end of their journey. Only a tiny fraction would make it out into the Atlantic Ocean. All along the path of the movement of an iceberg, there are numerous bays and shallow water areas where icebergs can be trapped. Most of it is destroyed before it ever reaches the, as far south as the island of Newfoundland. Over the next six months, the Titanic was in its final stages of being fitted out. An army of carpenters and craftsmen were at work creating the interior splendor of the ship. The captain chosen for the maiden voyage 
was Edward John Smith, the most experienced captain in the White Star Line. It was to be his last voyage before retiring. Smith was a very well-liked commander. He was nicknamed the Millionaire's Captain. People like Vanderbilt or Guggenheim or even J.P. Morgan would actually change their sailings and their travel arrangements so that they could sail in a ship commanded by Captain Smith. In March 1912, the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic, returned for emergency repairs. And so work on the final stages of the Titanic came to a standstill. The maiden voyage had to be pushed back a month. Instead of March, it would now be sailing in mid-April, the month where most icebergs appear in the shipping lanes in the North Atlantic. Despite only having a one in a hundred chance of survival, the iceberg had made it as far south as the east coast of Newfoundland. It still had a mass of over half a million tons and was drifting a further eight miles a day southward towards the shipping lanes. <laughs> 